Да, добрый день, Анна Леонидовна. Привет, ребята. Hi, Anna, and welcome to Russians with Attitude. Congrats on the baby. Как у тебя дела? Спасибо, привет, ребята. Спасибо за приглашение. Твой русский намного лучше, чем я ожидал на самом деле. Как тебе удалось сохранить русский язык? Ну, окей, uh, okay. so, у меня на самом деле, к сожалению, русский, наверное, на уровне пятиклассника, но у меня акцент в порядке. У меня как-то, как ни странно, да. это сохранился акцент. Я не понимаю, как это случилось, но, um, короче, я думаю, что моя мать, она, она бы сказала, что она uh, специально пыталась сохранить язык, но на самом деле она была очень ленивая. Сама не хотела выучить английский, так что она с нами говорила только по-русски. Она с тех пор не говорит по-английски, на самом деле. Based. Yeah. А кто лучше говорит, ты или Даша Некрасова? А, это я не знаю. У Даши тоже хороший акцент очень, но мы вместе никогда не говорим по-русски. Мы иногда, как, как сказать, делаем слаб какие-то слова. Uh -huh. а, но я думаю, что у нее тоже русский в порядке, на самом деле. Окей, okay. back to English, because our audience doesn't speak Russian, unfortunately, yet, but uh, it will soon change. So, uh, I first saw your Twitter account about four years ago. Uh, you were writing very much uh, on-point cultural analysis on American society and whatnot, uh, but uh, you had your usual avatar of Алла Пугачева. So this is not something you see every day. As a Russian, I was intrigued. Uh, then you and Dasha launched a widely successful podcast, Red Scare, and the show starts off blaring a tattoo song that was recorded uh, 20 years ago, Ya Sashla Suma. So very good stuff. Alas, you too sound very turbo American. Simply not enough Russian flair. But fear not, because RWA is here to save your <laughs> brand and help you return to your roots. So, uh, Anna, is uh, being all mysterious and foreign compared to your average uh, cornbread American important to you? Um, well, I don't know if it's important to me. It's important to others. I mean, listen, it helps a lot um, in terms of like the... Uh, sexual marketplace because uh men like you more just because they think that you're like uh uh natasha Fat fatal or something from a what's that <laughs> cartoon rocky and bullwinkle um i don't really care either way you know there's a, that great quote from um charles mingus americansky jasmine you know he said like i was like too black for the white kids uh and too white for the black kids so i hung out with the jews and the mexicans And I'm like very American. I'm too American for Russian people, and I'm too weird and foreign for Americans. So I just hang out with faggots. <laughs> Don't insult us like that. <laughs> uh, speaking of tattoo, uh, was this band the last uh, culture phenomenon from Russia that you were familiar with? Um, well, no, unfortunately, the last cultural phenomenon from Russia that I'm familiar with is Pussy Riot, um, which, you know, they're lucky that at least one of them is extremely hot, because I don't know how they, they come from Russia, but kind of uh, promote a brand of American liberal feminism that is like very Clintonite, you know? Like, yeah. Nadia came to the United States, as a matter of fact, she came to L.A. and started shilling for, like, Hillary. Yeah, she might be more American than you, but uh, <laughs> she probably doesn't know even English. So you might be off uh, talking that you're too American for Russians, because a lot of Russians are Americanizing at a dangerous pace. But uh, a bit about Tattoo, a tidbit, uh, its producer, Ivan Shapovalov, said in some interview that he was simply browsing porn sites in late 90s, <laughs> and then it came to him, lesbian pop band. Yeah. Genius idea, I think. So was Tattoo a big thing for you in the early 2000s? 
not not at all not at all i well, i don't care about this band outside of it being like a minor historical curiosity but they did i'm very ashamed to admit they did expose me to my favorite band ever which is the smiths because they did a cover of how soon is now and i remember listening to this like janky euro produced cover like winding through the streets of suburban new jersey at night in my like 2006 honda civic or whatever it was and thinking like man this is a great song and sure enough i looked it up and it was not their song but you know since then you know they changed my life completely because i've been to like 14 or 15 morrissey shows um and i'm like a diehard like morrissey fan thanks to tattoo yeah that's uh, underwhelming because uh, all true <laughs> russians are very nostalgic about tattoo even if uh, just because of their insane international fame yeah i think it's it's not because of tattoo the cultural phenomenon on itself it's just uh, people are nostalgic for because the time was politically speaking more innocent and and people were just like Wow, there's this cool Russian band, hot chicks, nice, cool. I think, and, uh, <laughs> I think they're nostalgic for two chicks kissing. That's like the international <laughs> language of love. That has nothing to do with Russia. <laughs> Every time uh, two hot chicks lock lips anywhere, like dozens of men, you know, whip out their camera phones. Yeah. So if we are to distill the essence of Red Scare, which I listened to about five minutes, uh, in my mind, it's about uh, cutting all the bullshit and asking one simple question, hot or not? So left, right, conservative, liberal, uh, and the rest of antiquated garbage uh, doesn't matter because um, you gave the clear pill to the unwashed American masses. Uh, an ideology could be hot or ugly. So let's uh, play a little blitz game i say a name and you say it's hot or not well i oh, sure we can do that we can gamify i like that in the grand american tradition but i thought i really thought that you distilled the the appeal of red scare perfectly is that uh, no one actually listens to it that's <laughs> actually what we stand for people <laughs> people angrily post on uh, twitter and forums about us but no one's actually heard the podcast anyway hit me yeah, so the biggest sponsor of our show, Vladimir Putin. That's hot. Is he hot? Is he hot? No, I think he's disgusting. He's a. Uh, oh. He's like, he's, you know, the picture of Ubojstva. <laughs> Fire Gubashnika. He's like, he's like a Gubashlop, yeah. you know, he's like everything that I don't like about Slavic men. Um, uh -huh. But um, I'm going to have to say, as much as I find him personally repulsive and unappealing, counter to many women across the globe um i don't fall for like the horseback riding or gun shooting pics um yeah i think he's shaped like a cheap side table uh i would say that it's pretty hot that he poses at least a symbolic but probably a concrete political challenge to the hegemony of the west and you know their tradition of soft power because the thing that i fear most of all which pussy riot was kind of a um dry run or dress rehearsal for is russians going woke yeah is navalny hot and the same problem as putin so you don't like uh, his appearance i don't also. like these i don't like the kind of um ribie glaza mm -hmm like this fish kind of eyes. very yeah the fish eye thing like it, it's very it's too slavic for me Glazana yeah but uh -huh. i've never you know i i'm like a i think arguably slavic people would have the same problem with me because i have a very like caucasian semitic look so i'm just you know i prefer what's familiar to me yeah so you didn't wish to be dominated by the slavic master <laughs> race no <laughs> Okay, what race do you like to be dominated by? Uh, Is it just Armenian? Isn't it boring? Or Jewish, you know? No, well, you know, it's what's interesting is that um, I'm not really a fan of Armenians, seeing as I didn't grow up culturally Armenian. The, the thing I would liken it to the most is probably being like Italian-American, 
where you lost complete touch with your culture, but you know, like, you know, like spaghetti and the Sopranos or whatever. Um, I have no connection to my Armenian roots whatsoever yeah. outside of like my father's genes dominating my mother's. Every American Armenian, the only connection to uh, Soviet or wider Russian culture is just Pugacheva, literally. They all yeah. know her because of uh, the parents. So what music uh, did your parents listen to? My parents? Um, they didn't listen to Pugacheva. Um, <laughs> I think my weird. mother... Very weird. I think my mother listened to like... I mean, they listened to like boomer rock. Yeah. Beatles, Stones. My dad had a very um, evolved music taste. He liked kind of like your Wysotsky, your Sieverne, that sort of thing, the Russian yeah. bards. But Chanson. he also listened to, uh, his favorite was Richter, right? The Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Russian He's great. German pianist. And so, I mean, that's kind of what I grew up listening to, like my father blaring. But they had a very kind of like uh, open-minded, broad-minded taste. He would blast Stevie Wonder and Steely Dan, both of whom I hate, um, <laughs> and then follow it up with like, Bach or Beethoven or something. So let's talk a bit about you again. Uh, you were born in the family of a brilliant mathematician in Moscow. And uh, during the perestroika, the USSR was uh, faring pretty bad and your family, alongside of probably millions of people, escaped the collapsing country in the late uh, 80s. Did your family actually wish to go to America or were they forced to due to the perestroika and its consequences? Um, that's a good question. I think that probably if you poll my mother, um, she would say that um, they wanted to. If you polled my father, who is no longer with us, he would probably say that um, they were forced. Um, I'm sure that uh, my father had some regrets about coming to the United States because I think, you know, he probably would have been richer had he stayed in Russia. In the 90s? Yeah. That's weird. It wasn't academia collapsed in, in almost every field in the 90s. That's why he left? Because there was no money, probably? Yeah, but I, I think that he would have gone into like a private industry, right? Oh, he's, yeah. He's, he's an applied mathematician. Sure. So virtually like all of these, this new class of criminals, for example, had, um, they all have um, kind of STEM degrees, right? They're all scientists and mathematicians. Like Berezovsky. Like Berezovsky. He's also like a mathematician, like, yeah. Yeah, all of these guys. And I think my dad would probably so land on his feet somewhere there. So he could be an oligarch. A yeah. mini-garch, probably not an oligarch. So what uh, fate would you like more, to be an American bohemian like now or Russian uh, gangster princess? I mean, that's hard to say. It seems that it's probably more lucrative for me to be an American bohemian. Uh, I think had I stayed in Russia, I would have had like a nose job and been uh, maybe 20 IQ points dumber, but that's also a good alternative. <laughs> um, so how did your Soviet parents uh, adapt to American reality? Not at all, <laughs> very poorly. I mean, I think that, you know, like I said, my, my uh, mother, you know, again, never, never worked, never bothered to learn English. So we had a very kind of insular family life. Uh, my father was forced to adapt because he taught in an American faculty. Uh, and he was by far the more kind of uh, social and talkative of the two. Um, but I think it was, you know, difficult. Immigration is, you know, not, not to adopt the kind of trauma language of the United States, but immigration is like a very tough experience. Uh, did you notice when you were a child that your upbringing uh, was maybe different from your American peers? Or uh, what were the great differences between the Russian, Soviet or ex-Soviet family life and what American families were like? And this is where the free segment of our podcast ends. Free yourself from tedious American monoculture and subscribe to Russians with Attitude. Thank you.